Greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the online Optum learning series sessions. Today is the 43rd session and I would extend a warm welcome to everybody who is joined from India. We have uh, dedicates from Pakistan, Malaysia, uh, US, Canada. So thank you everyone for joining us. I do as you saw, Dr. Nitesh is very eager to talk about orthokeratology and, and I think uh, let me not waste much of a time, but just to introduce Dr. Nitesh he is the president of the British Indo-Pacific Orthokeratology Myopia Control Academy. He is the first fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control in the Europe and the only one in the United Kingdom. He specializes in fitting traumatized and irregular corneas with soft and rigid lenses. And he also has a special interest in myopia control and rehabilitation. He is also the General Secretary of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. And he is also the Fellowship Committee member, examiner, and the mentor of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. With a very vast experience of uh, fitting ortho K and contact lens into practice, I guess about more than 25 plus years, uh, he is going to talk to us today about the importance of ortho K lenses. He did, a uh, he did a session with us before where he uh, uh, you know, shared with us ortho K in practice. How do you start the ortho K practice? But today's talk is basically on the fitting, fitting perspective. And he's going to share with us some new ideas on fitting ortho K lens. So thank you very much, Dr. Nitesh, uh, for joining us. And uh, uh, let's get started. Thank you again, Dr. Din, for the introduction. <laughs> Uh, as I said, I've, like you just said, I've been doing this for a long time and basically I wanted to see if we can actually fit with one lens and if we can do it virtually. So, but before we can do that, we need to know the architecture. It's like if you're building or uh, making a building, you need an architect to design the plans which we can put into a pro process. So we need some form of knowledge on the architecture of the lens itself. Now, before I go on, I need to make sure there's a disclaimer so that I have no direct financial or proprietary interest in any of the companies or services mentioned in this presentation. The content and form is presented without commercial bias and does not claim so support or commercial product or services. Now, obviously, everybody has seen this picture. Now, what we are doing here is you can see the topography change where we want to wipe out the myopia. Uh, the top picture just showing you pre cornea pre ortho k and then post ortho k so that's our aim but to do this we need to know the architecture of the lens itself so let's start with the lens itself now alignment is the curvature which is the first curvature we need to look at if the alignment is here so if you look at this area that looks as if there's not much floors in there that actually controls the lens movement and centration. So it's a very, very important curve to note. The next one is the base curve. Now the base curve, again, if you look at it here, there's not much fluorescence in there, but there is. It's hard to see. It's about five micron to eight to 10 microns, approximately tier layer there. Now the, the base curve itself has no effect on the lens fit. Because a lot of people make this mistake. They look at the base curve and assume that's with the traditional RGP lens fitting, yes, base curve method. Here, base curve does not affect the fit itself. Provides a planation force necessary to distribute the tissue. That's what really the base curve is for. Now, the next curve we need to think about is the third, the more important curve is the reverse curve. Now, the reverse curve is where this fluorescent reservoir is, as you can see there. And it's just up here. It provides the reservoir of the tears, which radically alters the efficacy of the treatment. And you can stiffen or flatten the fit by altering the reverse curve. And it also connects the base curve and the alignment curve. And the final curve, which we have to also look at, is the peripheral curve. Now, the peripheral curve provides adequate edge lift to facilitate lens movement and tear exchange. So, again, if you look at the peripheral curve, it's 
that actually if you were fitting RGP lenses, it's very, very easy to understand that. Plus the alignment curve. Those two are actually in the original you know, RGP lens fitting. Now let's design a lens, but first we need to look at some other factors. The Jason factor, or we, I call it the fudge factor on ortho K. Why do we need a fudge factor? Because base curve to final Rx is not exactly one to one relationship. It provides slight overcorrection. And Jason factor will allow for the regression throughout the day. So we have to understand that if you do one to one ratio, your Rx, what you flatten, will finish earlier and therefore regresses. So therefore, you need to make sure the regression occurs when the patient has gone home to bed before the regression takes place. How much fudge factor do we need? Now, average myop, we think minus 125. High myops greater than six diapers increase accordingly caution with incipient presbyops. The other thing I can add on here, where Kerry Hasenberg, uh, the president of IOMC, always talks about is that uh, increase the digestion factor for your myopia control patients. So it can help there also. In designing the lenses, we are going to be looking at the K readings. Now, the K readings, as you know, it can be in diopter or in you know, millimeters, whichever you prefer. But what you're looking at is we are designing these lenses. The first K reading is 42.75. Second K reading is 43.75, X is 90. Eccentricity, now very, very important, not 0.50. That's another part of the architecture which we need to look at the eccentricity in a minute. The actual spectacle power is minus 3, cylinder is minus 0.50, X is 180, and vertex distance 12. Now, the idea of orthokeratology is basically for a lens to fit and for the tissue to move. The epithelial layer has to move. That's what we're really aiming for. So what you're doing from this picture to this picture, as you can see, is the movement of the cells. Now, it's fluid forces. There's also what we call compression forces taking place at the same time, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, base go or back optics of zone radius plus Jason factor. We need to look at that. So if you look at now how we're going to design this lens, you've got to manifest refraction is minus 3, minus 0 0.5 or 180. So if we just get it to target Rx is minus 3 to 5, with the Jason factor of 1 to 5, now with the target power we require is min minus 450. Now the flat K is 42.75, 7.90 if you saw earlier. So the base curve will be 450 flat a K, which will lead to 38.25, 8.80. Now here, I'll, my first lecture, somebody did ask me this question on what is the, the power ratio. No, half a diopter requires one millimeter of change, 0.1 millimeter of change. Now, E will E value the eccentricity, which I said, let's demystify it. So, if you look at the eccentricity defines corneal shape, it is the rate of corneal flattening as you move away from the, the corneal apex. So, if you look at the apex there and the flattening that's taking place, so if the E value was zero, it would be a sphere. So, it would be just straightforward. Average corneal E value is point, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. Now, in my practice, I get a lot of Indian patients. So my average eccentricity value at the moment I found is about 0.5 for my Indian patients. Chinese is slightly different. And then Caucasian patients is not far from uh, the, the Indian population. So you can see the curvatures here. If you look at what I mean by this, this is the flattening, what's happening here. Now, if E was 0 0.00 to 0 0.3, then you fit on flat K. If E was 0 0.00 to 0 0.45, fit 0 0.25 on flat K. If E was 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, fit 0 0.50. So if you look at here, the alignment curves. Now, this is what the E value is very responsible for. And 
uh, one of the manufacturer's contacts actually specifically fits on E, eccentricity values. So the alignment curve here, if you can see here, is uh, what we got here is the base curve is 42.75, uh, sorry, the flat K. We've then gone on and calculated it to 8.80, the base curve required for the target. But now we need the alignment curve to fit the lens. So here we've now gone by half as the E value is 0.50 in my earlier table I showed you. So that's where we got that figure from. This is what is important. A lot of people don't realize where that figure comes from. Now you can see that 8.80 where we got is 38.25. 1 to 5 is the Jessen factor. Center thickness of the lens, diameter 10.6. Optical zone we've used is 6 point millimeters, which is standard with many manufacturers. Reverse curve is 6.95. And intermediate curve is at 8. Secondary curve is 8.8. .8, and peripheral curve is at 12. So if you look at the actual tiers now, the profile, you can see what's happening. That's the alignment curve area there. So it's actually connecting that reverse curve there and then to the peripheral curve. Again, explaining here. Now, here we are seeing this, that area there is 10 microns. Now, when you're fitting a lens, what we need is a good compression, good seal. So what you're looking here for aligned fit properly, this is what should be happening. So you can see where the lens is now coming in. It's not touching completely, although on the diagram it's slightly misleading. But what it's doing is it's giving the lens a little bit of a movement. At the same time, you're getting good compression there and you're getting a good seal. But let's see if we do it slightly different. A stiff fit. Now, what happens with a stiff fit if the alignment is too stiff here? then there's not going to be any compression. And therefore, you will not get a correction. Now, if you've got a, a flat alignment curve, what happens here is if you can see it, the lens is going to slightly displace because the, there's a, too much bearing on the actual apex. And there's poor seal here, so the lens will actually be moving around, the fluid will be moving. So you will not have any reverse curve fluid there left for it to correct the myopia. And if, if it's flat, it will decenter also. So if you look at that now, what happens here? So good compression here, but poor compression because now the lens has actually tilted a bit. And there's a poor sill valve and there's a good sill. Now here, there's two reasons for it. One is the alignment curve, but the alignment curve may be wrong is because the cornea itself was slightly tilted or it was toric. So therefore, this is where the lens didn't correct because the lens wasn't fitted properly. Now, if you look at this, this is a good fit or not. Now, certain lenses are designed where for certain powers, this may be, but for you who are learning today, this is not a good fit. Now, if you look at an optimum fit, this is what it should look like. If it's flat, you can see here the leaking taking place. So that's a one diopter flat there. Half a diopter, you can see just a little bit of leaking. If it's too steep, then you can see what's happening here around inside. Same thing here. This is a slide I should thank GOV for because that's their lens designs which we use, I'm showing you here. Now, the lens diameter also is very, very important because I didn't put that up earlier. Because if you want to control the lens movement, then you can control it with the lens diameter too. So if you do not want to use, if it's just a mild toric per, uh, a cornea, then you can use a lens diameter to control it. And there are people up uh, in USA, and I myself have done it, we've gone actually Although it says here 90 to 95% of HVID, we've actually gone up to 11.2 or 11.4 even, further than the cornea, fly over the limbus. Now measuring, obviously, the HVID is quite simple. As you can see, you can just measure from white to the white of the eye. And this is how you would find the diameter, 95% 11 millimeter. 
again this is controlled with actual diameters now here you can see this is a good diameter of the lens and you can see the fluorescent better so this is where we not use the torus lens although maybe the cornea may be tilted we're just using lenses where the diameter is much much nicer so if you look at this is quite small as you can see that one again not really good up there same thing happening here same thing there so diameter is quite critical and gov lenses are actually con controlled with diameter now the design philosophies Diagnos diagnostic trial sets now you can use emerald euclid gov inventory paragon crt where you have a trial set you put the lens in decide on what the fit looks like change the diameter like i told you with gov or emerald euclid any of them you can do that paragon has their own cal uh, calculator which you can use in order to try the lenses that way now the other way is to use an empirical way now that the lenses that are available are dream lens, context, Euclid trial lens, ordered. Now these lenses are ordered by you giving certain data to the manufacturer, like HVID, base curve, and the actual refractive power. And then send you a lens, and once the lens you put it on, if it's not uh, fitting properly, you can then send the information to, again, to the manufacturers or the technicians, who will then help you guide to get the right fitting. And they will change the parameters for you but here you're not in control they are taking the control again it's it's not a bad system I have tried, I've tried all those systems too now the other system that's can be used is if you got a topographer you can have a software linked to the topographer at the moment Z uh, night lens from Manicon is based on that dream lens is based on that B retainer is based on that here again the manufacturer software is for a particular design which they're using like the be is a more a seg design so therefore they they're using their own designs again the control slightly is with actual the manufacturer on what to do so you're getting help through that so again no no harm in doing that the fourth one which i now looking at and i'm doing myself i mean i've been called a waiver in my my, my about 10 years ago, I went into, or 10 for 15 years ago, I've been doing WAVE. And obviously, there's WAVE software, there's author tool software, iSpace, and RGP designer. Now, those are the ones where you actually take control of designing. Now, WAVE has got, as I say, a system where you actually take the topography Mac and uh, topographer and they connect straight on to the WAVE software. Now the software is is pretty good in the sense of it will give you the actual tier profile live in real time, so, and then you can design the lens accordingly from there. But you need some tuition and learning to do that. Ortho tool is a software where you have to actually put in the data, and then there are certain uh, uh, parameters you can use, or there are certain um, what we call templates you can use on there in order to use uh, design the lens. iSpace works very similar to Wave in order again, they're using the topographer integrated into the software. So you're passing the topographer data straight onto the their software and then the lens is designed. Now, RGP is slightly designer, which I'm gonna talk about today. I've just explained to you about Wave software and iSpace because that Topography data captured directly and practitioner can custom design from there. RGP design and author tool are basically software where you put your data in and you design the lens. So it's like an artist. I give you all the paints and then you again the brushes and then you design to do your artwork. So those two are actually giving you the space to do your own artwork. And also keratology, I call it either engineering or uh, artwork. Now, I want to put this man in front of you because he actually, I met him first time in five years ago. His name is Giuseppe Toffoli. Now, he actually, I was examining him for a fellowship and you will never know who you'll meet and when you'll meet and what they'll do later on. He's a very, very nice gentleman, very humble. And what fascinated with me, and this is if you guys take a fellowship, it's, very, it's quite important that fellowship it will give you certain things in life which will make you drive 
and do things. So fellowship of IMC through BPOC you can do is very, very you know useful to do. I'm not plugging in at the moment that, but with the Jisafi Trafoli, when he actually came for the fellowship, he had two practical cases he had to present. And the fascinating thing was he actually presented two cases which actually didn't work as well, but yet he went through the whole procedure explaining what he did. And a few years later, guess what he comes up with? rgpdesigner.com. So due to him, we now can think about let's design a lens virtually. Now, points to consider fitting objectives. Lens needs to be central. And I always say location, location, location. That's the most important thing. If the lens in, sits in the right place, then it will work. And target is the other, to correct or reduce the power. So with the RGP designer, here what you're doing is initially you're putting patient data in. Now you saw me put in the data previously, which was on ortho, ortho tools. This one is with the RGP now. Again, if you can look at it, 7.9 of you, you just want to deal with the right eye. Eccentricity is 0.55. Chef vector 0 0.68. Axis 180. Step radius is 7.60. Step E is 0 0.55. And the step P shape is 0 0.698. HVID is 12 millimeters. Now here, make sure when I'm going down, I'll explain to you what I'm doing. The next bit we need the information to put in is the, the power. So it's minus four, but with a vertex distance, 3.75. 0 0.50 cylinder, axis 180. Vertex distance 12 millimeters, and obviously it's not a press B up, so it's 0 0.008 power. Now, as soon as you put this data in, this is what RGP will give you a corneal shape. And this is all simulations, as you can see. So this is not a topography maps. This is actually the data you put in. Now if you got a topographer, you can actually look it up on your topographer and it will look exactly the same, especially this map here. You'll see that exactly what you're seeing here is from the topographer. Although this is not topographer, it's just the data you put in. The next bit we are now going to look at is the 375 because of the vertex distance, the target power we require, compression factor we can choose is 1 to 5, although it will advise you can do 150. So the actual software is telling you what you can do. The lens power is 125 plus 125 on the lens itself. Now the flat E correction. Now you remember, if you look at the old photography we used to do, we used to have, uh, you took a photograph and then you had to dial up into a negative and then into a positive. So this is where the E value 0 0.55 has become minus 0 0.55. And the steep E correction, because it was same, so it was minus 0 0.55. The shape, we are going to go for spherical alignment. I'll talk about this in a minute. Now this, oops, let me just go back here. These are the curves and the widths, which are all given up out here, which again, you can see it's a three millimeter standard lens. So it's six millimeters optic zone. Tear lens thickness is going to be eight microns under the, the center. And then it goes optic, tear lens optic zone. So this is where the reverse curve comes in. This is all the curvatures, so it's a uh, four, four curve lens. That's what this means, basically. Now, if you look at here, this is what the TL profile is. So it looks like a good ortho K lens. You can see this is what it will give you out. The software does this. But look at this. This is a floor pa uh, sin pattern. Now, here the floor sin pattern, this is not actually a, on a patient. This is what the actual software will tell you. That what it looks like now to me here you can see that not very good because there is some leakage this, this lens is going to tilt so let's go further I'm gonna put this on. now what this software does also is show you the force lens forces Now you can go around this and actually see where the forces are. And if you look at this,
the forces here and forces here are ex exaggerated there and here again there's forces so but the problem is there's no forces here so this is what the fluorescent pattern actually showed us what was happening this is how the lens would look Again, I'm just showing you what the lens is. Again, this is all on the software. This is get, telling you in 3D, actually, what the lens will look like. Now, what, I call this the lens sombrero. So again, we're looking at where the forces of the lens are applied. Again, this is quite an instant, instant, interesting, you know, when you look at it, where the forces are applied, how it looks. Because remember the positive negative, that's what you, you are going to create a contact lens on your cornea. The forces have to act on the cornea. Again, you can see the toricity is there, therefore this is the area where the forces are, but no force is there. Now let's change this fitting. So we now realize that the fitting won't, won't be good. This is a good thing about designing virtually. Earlier on this was spherical, now I've changed this into toric alignment. I've kept the optics on, again, spheric, but actual well, alignment is what I've changed here. Because I could have changed this also into toric, but we don't need to because there's no much of a cylinder here, the, the power. So again, if you look at all the curvatures, what's happened here is now we've got two sets of curvatures at different angles. So if I show you now the TF profile, you can see now we've created these two zones. This is the flat meridian and the stiff meridian. Now, if I go back earlier, you can see what was happening. But earlier we had to clue this. If you look at the gap here, the software had already told me, so I could have actually chosen this, but to show you this, this is why I did it this way. So this is where I've changed now the toric alignment, basically, and therefore you got this now. So you got now both meridians being covered. So we've got now the lens looks like this. Isn't that much better? So you can see now it looks good. And this is virtual fitting, not even on a patient tried. So I know now I can order this lens and it will do the job. So are we now at this point virtual fitting yes we are we can do virtual fitting now if you look at again now the forces again all round forces remember that blue ring we want the flattening in the middle and then the red zone it's all there going this is the force that's going to be applied to create that And if you look at the lens again, you can't, you can't tell much on the lens because this one wasn't very highly toric. It was just a very minute amount. Now, Randy Kojima, in, I think it was in 2016, said if it's over 30 microns peripheral on a topographer, if you check the heights, then you need to have a toric periphery. And here you can do that without even looking at a topographer. Once you put the data in, it's telling you. But this is, can be confirmed with the topographer too. And now you can look at the sombrero, as I call it. Again, the force is now for the negative positive. So this is where what's going to happen to your actual cornea, how the forces are going to be applied. So you can see what we've done here. Now, next bit we've got to think about is my epic control lens. So we got, so far, we've got the lens to fit perfectly with a you know, six millimeter optic zone. But let's say now we want to control on a child and we want to do my pair control lens. So we have got the toric alignment, which will fit the lens properly. But what we're going to change here is the back optic zone. We're going to make it a spheric too. So the reason for that we are doing it is to give you now a my pair control lens. Now with the my pair control lens, we need to alter here also. We need to make sure the diameter, 
the actual optic zone diameter changes. Now, I've done 2.7 here, which is 5.4 approximately. That's what it'll come to. So you can see what I've just done to control my up here. And basically, you can see here it becomes more narrower. And that's the bit we have now made the optic zone be smaller. And because giving the asphericity, you can see this green zone here a little bit coming inside now, inside the people zone. So you can see the 5.4. I don't know whether you guys can see the figures here. It's in the 5.46 and then 7.2, and 10.50. That's all. I've just changed the, slightly the diameter of the lens all at the same time because it's been a child. Again, this is what it's going to look like. Again, I can play the video, but these are the figures there again on the lens. The forces that's going to be acting again. You can see it's much wider ring on that red zone here. And you can see there a bit of asphericity coming in. Again, Sombrero is giving you that same effect there. You can see now how far it's gone in there. This is all with the software we are doing this now. So I'm going to stop here because I think this is enough information for today. And as I said, we can talk about it now. So the question and answer would be a better to do with. So if you have any problems or anything you want to sort out, we can discuss. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think, yes, this is a good time to take questions. And we do have a couple of questions already. Hey. So the first question here, Dr. Nitesh, is uh, as a beginner, do you usually recommend the practitioner to fit uh, using the virtual method or uh, they should still go ahead and fit with the empirical fit? I would advise empirical fit at the moment because you will need somebody to guide you, so somebody to hold your hand. So in order for you, first of all, choose something simple. And at the same time, empirical is the best way to do it because there will be some technician who will help you along the way. If you get further up, you will then have a mentor. You know, if you decide to do fellowship or something else, then you can get some mentors to help you design lenses at the same time. Then software is ideal. Virtual fitting is there. But in initially, I would advise empirical fitting or trial fitting even because that, as long as you can get help to get those patients through first. Because... Fourth yes, okay right. itself is a difficult fitting. You know, people think it's easy. It isn't. And a lot of people will fit a first few cases and feel, oh, I've done well. But no, no, no. You need to get 10 to 20 cases below your belt. And that will only happen after you've made a few mistakes and somebody's helped you along the way. Yeah. So as a beginner, I think you still uh, advise people to do a trial fit and then learn along the way. Yeah. Because what yeah. you're not understanding is that software requires a lot more knowledge. Training and knowledge, yeah. Here, yeah. layers and all this, what you can see. But when somebody's helping you, you're going to be stuck to seeing that, the mistakes that happen on the way. That's right. Much easier. But the long-term view should be, yes, with the software. OK. Uh, the next question is, uh, can we do trial method or trial lens fitting method uh, what we used to do on the patient uh, virtually with RGP designer software and then order the lens immediately. Yes, you can do that. I mean, I have practiced that way myself with the other softwares too. Because originally, I mean, you know, I made mistakes when I did empirical, whatever. I had a lot of lenses which I collected. And then I thought, hang on, if I'm using the software, I've got those lenses. Why can't I use those and see what, where I went wrong? So it would help in learning at the same time. So yes, it can be done, but please be make sure be, uh, be aware. I'm not selling any products here. I'm not, you know, tied to any of the companies. Yeah, this is just a general concept what we are introducing. That's and right. I think, Sakina, I think is based in Kenya at the moment, isn't she? The question. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Where I was born, actually, yeah. in Kenya. Yeah, she's also one of our speakers for the series, and she's quite uh, enthusiastic optometrist as well. Uh, yeah, I met Goa originally. Yeah, our conference. I see. I see. 
Okay, the next question would be, it's about uh, something about high myopia and topography, but I thought we'll just take it on. Uh, what's yeah. your recommendation? It's not related to ortho K directly, yes, but yeah. it's related to topography. So, uh, here, yeah. What he's saying is a patient with high myopia having history of cross-linking before six years and current refractive error minus six years bilateral, what will next tre treatment option? In, is this mandatory to take a topography test after six to eight months? I would do, obviously, do the uh, topography to check if that cross-linking is still working. Has it a, a changed anything? So you would need original topography before cross-linking, after cross-linking, and then six months to see what's happened. Now, That's the right. treatment option, ideally, I would say, I mean, again, here you're looking at uh, talking to an experienced fitter. So I could do, as I said, personally, I would have fitted that patient with ortho K lens, which is a nighttime one. But there is an option to uh, fit that patient with a daytime ortho K lens. Now, in there, we are not trying to mod re uh, model the cornea itself. All we are trying to do is give a cornea a breathing space. So we're, what you're doing is the alignment coven that is chosen for it to lift off the lens of the cornea itself and lending slightly away from it. So you're keeping the cornea safe. So daytime lens could be used, or scroll lens could be used too, or even normal RGP lens. Okay, just to uh, connect this question, uh, do you prefer a waiting period, minimum waiting period of uh, after cross-linking of fitting ortho K? See, with the orthokeratologists, uh, ortho, uh, ortho, ophthalmologists I work with in the uh, UK, some of them say within uh, two to three months I can fit them. So I do fit them within a few months. Okay. Ideally, okay. if you haven't got that connection with the ophthalmologist who's done the cross-linking, then I would wait six months at least minimum to see if there is any change occurring. Because you don't want to be paying for that change. That's right. Because yeah. if you're fitting somebody and then the cornea changes, that it would come up on you that the lens may have done it. That's right. Okay, and the next question here is, uh, I think uh, the name of the software, uh, I guess they are referring to the one we have explained, uh, what you have explained today. Yeah, and it's, uh, that is, uh, it's rgpdesigner.com. And does this software eliminate the use of a topographer in ortho -K lens fitting? Now, that's an interesting question, because in one way it doesn't, in way, one way it doesn't. You see, we are designing the lens, with, we can do it without the topographer, but the topographer is essential for E, first of all, eccentricity. We need the E value for it to work. So if you get the patient to go somewhere and get that topography done, and then you use the data to design lens and fit the lens, but then you, after the fitting, if you do want to change anything, then a topographer is essential. So I personally believe that, you know, you should not work without a topographer if you can help it or share it with somebody. I think yes, one has done in his lectures. I've done it in my lectures previously. We always say, if you cannot purchase a topographer yourself, share it with, go work, work with an ophthalmologist, somebody who's got a topographer and use it. So the software is be independent, yet not independent. Uh, the next question is, will the software consider for corneal abnormalities while designing the lens? Now, Othopool and there's another software wave, they actually tell you about the abnormalities directly, that there is something wrong here. This one, you have to be the judge. So you, if you know what your corneal should look like, then yes, you will be able to pick it up. Because this was originally designed, in fact, the Othopool was designed for our, you know, normal RGB lenses. So was RGP, designer was designed for normal RGP. Yeah. Giuseppe, you know, Topoli, the designer actually is more a RGP lens designer rather than also a designer. Okay. So the designing of the lens was based on that. So abnormally, yes, you can see it, but you need to know what you're looking at. While the other two software will actually tell you that there's, there's something wrong, this could be character corners or something like that. Okay, uh, next question is, are there any limitations in terms of uh, the parameters in RGP lens designer? 
the word limitation now the limitation means by the parameters of the rgp designer now there's no limitation because on the rgp designer there is a template for designs of lenses you can use now those have limitation because they've been put templates have been put by certain designers in there so let's say if i put a parameter and say minus six is the only one i can do on there and that's the template there so if you're using that as a template form the uh, the actual software then yes there are limitations but if you're doing it like i told you as a painter where you've been given the paint brushes and your paints and you design it you know you draw the art similarly you can design with no limitations but you need to have the knowledge to do it so the actual software is, is a tool it's not anything else it's you having the knowledge to put that data in and manipulate that tier layer that's how actually the lens is designed okay. so it's a good question. there's no limitation provided you have the knowledge yeah yeah and there are people around the world who are using this i mean there's one uh, gulnara in uh, russia in ophthalmologist he is doing fantastic designs at the moment through that software you know in okay. doing high ips you know minus 11s minus 12s so there are people who are achieving now a lot more higher stigma than 450 sales, 350 sales. It can be done, but mm -hmm. using it's a tool. It's that's all it is, you know. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you are putting, applying what knowledge you have. That's right. And the next question is: uh, If we get beyond plus four diopter in the reverse curve, uh, do we still make the base uh, back surface aspheric? What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, you don't need to, but in making a spheric, there is an advantage. You're creating a very focal effect. Mm -hmm. That's what a sphericity means, basically. You know, you're gradually building that red zone. So you yeah. give the power in, in lack of very focal spectacle lens, you know, is gradually increasing. So for a child, you know, it gives them that little bit, you know, distortion and that which you may think, or, you know, other factors which may affect vision. You're minimizing that so there's no harm in doing the aspheracity but it's up to you realistically whether you want to do it or not so it's a very good question but for yes definitely you don't need to because that's yeah. my particular range where you want that also okay to work at but let's say somebody's a minus one you will go and want to build it over minus four uh you know the plus four range up there so you can do it with the software but at the same time put the aspheracity in there so that's the beauty i think of the of the software that you can see everything what's happening and you can actually see the fluorescent pattern and how the cornea is going to change after the lens wear yeah, it's basically it's a virtual fit as is, as i said to you before we yes. think before you actually order it you know right. and the beauty of it, this is you can order anywhere as long as you got they've got the ability you know like that machine to do a reverse scope okay uh the next question is about oxygen permeability is there anything in terms of uh, oxygen permeability in terms of ortho lens or higher i the, guess yeah higher the, or, or, you know dk value the better it is because you want more oxygen it's night time you're closing your eyes so maximum oxygen required is the most important thing you know yes so higher the, i mean there's now 200 dk material available you know but to, if you think of 100 percent something do we need a 200 dk material although it's available now on the market yeah yeah but if something is 100 percent are you going to get any more than that you know yeah. so i think the manufacturers are now going to that high dk value of 200 percent but to me it's limit is 100 percent if you can get 100 percent you know the you know auction supply to your cornea in a closed eye then you're doing very well you know and most of the, the, the there are 120 140 180 and 200 now as i say but that's important that yeah it's it's high decay material you know the, your it's a cornea is a living membrane it didn't, does not have a blood supply it does need oxygen and especially night time we are relying on the tear reservoir to give it the oxygen plus the lens breathing itself Yes. You know, so yes, there is the advantage that you're putting a tear reservoir with the oxygen supply through that, and I call it a building a dam in the eye. You know. Yeah. Okay. 
and uh, the question is about uh, connecting question about character corners so are you fitting patients with cross-linking character corners patients with ortho k what's your experience about this oh uh, now this is bruce williams uh, always competing with me the good question bruce <laughs> I am fitting them, yes, but again, I would not advise anybody else to do it. That's the yeah, knowledge when you get to a certain level. You know, I always say to people is that, yes, I have fitted a few. I've got a, actually, I'm going through a Polish patient at the moment who had refractive surgery done and then had car uh, character corners through that. And then obviously she had cross-linking done again, but the prescription was quite high. It went up to, she originally had a, the prescription of minus 550, which when she had the refractive surgery, when she came to me, which was a few months ago, was minus 650 with a minus 250 sale with cross linking done. And she still didn't want to wear the glasses and she was having a lot of other distortion problems. So we actually fitted her with Ortho K. Okay. And I think we'll have, we have a couple of questions. Let me just take them on. Uh, is there anything about your experience on fitting the soft contact lenses that mimic ortho K lenses and about their efficiency? The ones that you probably have heard about the, the myopic control lenses, which are trying to mimic, and then there is a true uh, soft lens that actually does mimic ortho K, which I think comes from uh, GOV. That actually truly actually behaves like an ortho K lens. They're not bad, to be honest. I mean, uh, my case, I don't know why in my practice, I've actually personally, on a personal level here, I look at the, any lens I fit on a child, if you're talking at a myopia point of view, I look at it, if they're going to be wearing them outside, you have got contamination problems now with the COVID and all this, but at the same time, other problems going on with lens falling out, whatever they're playing sports or whatever, wouldn't it be better to put a lens where there's a total control, where the parents even have the control? wear it at night when they're sleeping. There are risks, obviously, but there are very similar risks to any daily wear. The lens which uh, Mark Bolivar has actually done research on and sh showed us. So I have always stayed away from giving children soft lenses in the past, you know. Okay. I've always gone for okay. And that's my personal view. I'm not knocking those lenses out or anything, but they do work. That I'm not saying they don't work. But mm -hmm. that's each practitioner's point of view, what they feel, what they should be doing. Yes, there'll be a lot number of people you could fit them. It's much easier to fit, There's definitely. But it's your professional, you know, ethics, what he tells you, what you feel may be beneficial in the long term for the patient. That's where, and I look at it, it's okay with the myopia control lens now. You give them 80 to 90% control. You know, my patients I'm looking at, including my own two children, you know, have grown up. With also okay, and uh, you know, been very successful with it. So, if I can put my own children on it, I don't see why you know we can't realistically, you know, do it on other patients. If, if I wouldn't put it on my child, then I wouldn't not do it. Yeah. yeah, there's one more question about uh, the correction time. So, as per the experience goes, uh, how much time do you think uh, will it take to correct about two diopters of myopia? Just now, a rough uh, question. Does it have a you, bit of uh, overnight? You should be able to do it now with the modern design of lenses. It should be not be a problem. I think Bruce Williams is probably listening to us. He probably will say he's knocking them out within a few hours. You know that kind of power is not a big big problem now. Yeah. Depending on obviously the cornea itself, there are other issues with corneas that that may go you know delay it. But otherwise, normal corneas you know, overnight they wake up in the morning, they should be gone. And that's what I see day, day out 90% of the time. Okay, and there's one question I think some educator probably is asking that, and if you have any uh, suggestions on terms of resources where beginners or students would get uh, some guidance regarding ortho -K lenses, uh, would you have any reference? I mean, at the moment, the, the, in fact, I knew you. this question would come up. Okay. Now, this was a textbook. It's not available at the moment. Okay. This Mount is the orthokeratology. Yeah. 
One of my colleagues, uh, Trushik Dewey, was one of the co-authors in here. He's not far from me, about 25 miles from here in Coventry. So that was a textbook that was printed earlier, but there is now a new textbook that's come out also recently. Now, Fundamentals of Orthokeratology. And it's uh, by a US professor from Michigan University. I'm just trying to think of his name just for, for a second. Uh, so it's available. If somebody will email me, because my email, you can give them an email and I can give them the details on that so they can purchase that textbook. There is also, we in BPOC are going to be ish providing, or if they go into IMC website or, you know, the AMOC website, there's this book also, textbook available also on orthokeratology. Now, this is orthokeratology practice. So there is a few textbooks out now. And obviously, with your lectures we are doing now, so they will be helpful in the future if it's, you know they're developed into like you recording them and giving them yes. them out eventually. So there is information there. Uh, BIPOC uh, website at the moment is down, which will which once it comes back on, we'll have educational. You know, once you remember, you can go on to the bibliography and all that. So research papers, which Euro OK Ortho website is already doing. So they've already got that the website is running. But you need to be a member of one of the sites to get onto it, you know. Yeah. So it will be available for, uh, as an educational pre pre platform. Again, joining one of the associations, you will get mentors in the future, which is what, again, BIPOC is aiming to do in our area. As you can see, that's where we want to come, India, Malaysia, and all those areas where we can provide education to the new you know, students, whoever needs help in any way. So yes, there is information to begin give us a few months and we will be as i said the website should be back on we're trying to do a few more things that we've got with the board members we're trying to also the, the actual fee which we had originally was a little bit you know comparable to uk uh, fees for the bcla but we think we will reduce it for you guys so we can make it a little bit better and students actually have a discounted rate membership anyway thank you so much for sharing that knowledge with us and I think uh, Dr. Bruce has uh, uh, put up in the chat uh, the author of the book. Uh, it's uh, Michael Lipson from the University of Michigan. That's my yes, friend. Yes. This just launched a few months ago, so it's a very good book again. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Bruce. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for sharing all the thoughts and knowledge. And you know, uh, I'm very surprised that you know after 30 years of experience, you are still holding the orthokeratology book. I, I mean, I was surprised that the ortho K book is just next to you. No, let me just show you something else. This is actually a museum piece. Okay. So. Uh, the, the one thing one every ortho K guy, I mean Bruce was listening to us obviously will say to you is that we are always learning. It's never ever ending. I am never ever finished learning. As I said to you, one of the guys I actually was examining was now coming up with the software where I'm using. So it's a learning pro process. It never ends. Ortho K is something that is improving day by day. You know, we would never have thought we could do a virtual fit. It's virtual. now possible. You know, so knowledge is to be gained in every way your uh, uh, knowledge is getting. We are doing this webinars. We never thought about this in the past, did we? Yes. You know, so that you know, we again, I had to learn to adapt to a new way of doing things here, even. You know, yeah. and similarly, again, if you look at education-wise, we are all learning different things. I mean, COVID has changed us completely at the moment. You know. Yeah. I hope you guys are all, you know, staying safe and your families are staying safe. That's the, the more important thing also. And thank you for all for joining and great questions. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Nitesh, for your very, I mean, uh, a very insightful talk and also for answering all the questions and giving us, uh, solving our doubts, especially giving us the reference book for people who are interested in. So thank you very much uh, for taking out the time and taking the session at the OLS online optom learning series. So uh, I'm just putting up on the slide. So we have a session tomorrow again, as I mentioned last week that this weekend is a contact lens weekend. So uh, tomorrow we have a session about toric contact lenses where we have uh, Ms. Lakshmi Shinde and she's going to talk to us about uh, toric contact lenses, how is it different between the practice and teaching and how you should go about it. 
it's the same time as today uh, 6 30 indian time and 9 pm evening uh, the malaysian time i hope everybody can join in until then stay home stay safe uh, and take care see you all tomorrow bye bye thanks thank you thank you dr nagesh